For many of you, our presenter this evening is a friendly face, perhaps as a neighbor here in Vail or as a frequent moderator here at the Vail Symposium. Greg Dobbs has been our guide across the geopolitical landscape, including programs about Russia, Qatar, Iran, Germany, and many more. Greg's ability to present complex topics for an audience through the minds of subject matter experts is evident in these many programs, and in some ways is the topic of the presentation tonight. His ease in difficult conversations and the remarkable breadth of his knowledge is hard won, earned through his 50 years as a journalist. His career included 25 years as a foreign correspondent for ABC in many conflict zones, and his accomplishments have been recognized by a shelf full of awards, including three of the Emmy variety. His book, Life in the Wrong Lane, Why Journalists Go In When Everyone Else Wants Out, captures the drama, tragedy, and occasional comedy of the life of this foreign correspondent from years ago. Today, as then, we all rely on these brave professionals to provide glimpses of truth from places like Ukraine, Israel, Haiti, and so many more volatile environments that impact the global order. To regale us with his experiences and insights in the comfort of this beautiful chapel or your living rooms in Vail, please welcome Greg Dobbs. James, thank you. <laughs> I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say after that. The book is called Life in the Wrong Lane, but I'm not here to talk about the book, except, of course, to say that there is no better birthday gift, Christmas, Hanukkah, <laughs> Thanksgiving, whatever, uh, than Life in the Wrong Lane. But I'm here to talk about the title because it's the life of many foreign correspondents, those who are out there doing today what I did many, many years ago. Life in the wrong lane means you are not living in the right lane. The title came, by the way, when I was writing the book, one night when I was watching a network newscast about a hurricane somewhere on the Gulf Coast. I don't remember where. I wasn't there, I wasn't covering it. I did cover my share of hurricanes, including Katrina. But I wasn't there, I was sitting in my living room, and in the network report, there was maybe a 10-second sequence, probably taken from the local affiliate's helicopter, of the interstate highway heading north away from the disaster that was pending. And it was a parking lot. Everyone in their right mind was in the right lane getting out. And during this 10-second sequence, that's where the idea for the title came from, all of a sudden, one car went whistling the other way. They were heading right into the storm. Now, that might have been some other first responders, but I said to myself, yes, the journalists, right on. You go into the right place. So I lived a lot of my life in the wrong lane, both domestically and overseas. When, many years ago now, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the last place you might want to be is on an airplane heading into Kabul. But about, they, they invaded, I remember, because it was the day after Christmas. I was about as far away as you could be. I was in the Bahamas with my almost two-month-old son and my slightly older wife. And I got paged. Who remembers pagers? Remember those? I don't know why we use them. You, you couldn't make a call, couldn't take a picture, couldn't ask a question of Siri, but it's the best we had. And I got paged. I knew about the invasion, this was maybe December 28th, saying, we want you to get out of the Bahamas. We were on an island called Eleuthera. The next thing you knew, I was on my way to Amsterdam because ABC News had found out that the Afghan airline, the name of it is Ariana, had a DC-10, they had a very small fleet, but they had a flagship airplane, a DC-10, that got caught out in Amsterdam when the Soviets came marching in. And they were selling tickets to go back to Kabul. There wasn't a big market for tickets that day to go to Kabul. <laughs> but there were about a dozen journalists. Uh, the ABC chartered a, a camera crew up from somewhere in Europe. I made my way over from the Bahamas. They'd never written that direct ticket before at the airport in Eleuthera. And there were about a dozen journalists, different companies that had found out about the flight. Most hadn't. And there were maybe half a dozen at best Afghan citizens who wanted to return home from Europe. So we were in the wrong lane heading into Afghanistan with the Soviet Union beginning to take over. When 
in Poland. I used to be the, one of the guys who went in and out during the, the exciting years of the Solidarity Trade Union. And so when the Soviet Union insisted to General Jaruzelski, he was the leader of Poland, that he bring down martial law because if he didn't, they would, he did. The day before it happened, I was in Poland doing some stories and I had just gotten home to London when ABC called and said, the Poles, kind of like the Afghans with their airplane, the Poles had a train that was stuck in Berlin and they were gonna bring it home and they were selling tickets. It was never hard for me to find tickets to go anywhere because there wasn't much demand. So that night I flew to Berlin and got on that train and rode into a very dark city of Warsaw. When the Gulf War started, the first Gulf War, the wrong place to be, the wrong lane to live in was the lane leading into Kuwait, but that's where all of us who did this kind of work wanted to be. Life in the wrong lane. But it brings its rewards. First of all, you get a front row seat to moments of history in modern times. Uh, you get adventures across the spectrum that you could never even dream of getting any other way. And with those adventures come an adrenaline rush that you wouldn't believe. You get exposure to the human condition. You see people at their best and you see people at their worst and you see them at their happiest and you see them at their saddest. You get the satisfaction sometimes, and this is one of my favorite things, of beating the bad guys at their own game. And I'll tell you stories in a minute about doing that in Moscow, about doing it in Afghanistan. And you get the even greater satisfaction of helping preserve as a Western journalist, and particularly as an American, blessed with the First Amendment, helping preserve the free flow of information, which is something that I, given my experiences and given the places I've gone, uh, might value more than most. So life in the wrong lane brings its rewards, but it also brings its costs. I have been beaten. I have been shot at. I've had, in two different places, machine guns held to my temple. In both cases, by the way, they were young teenage boys. By young, I mean they weren't 18, 19, they were 13, 14. And I remember thinking at the time of the power they must have felt having my life in their trigger fingers. I've been chased by a gang with machetes. I don't even think if Walter Cronkite were still alive and talking to you, he could tell you that. I've had friends killed next to me. You have interesting experiences. They're not always easy and they're not always safe, but they're stories you won't soon forget. I was assigned once to track down two uh, arms dealers. They were, CIA, they were both former CIA agents who had gone rogue. Uh, they had gone over to the dark side. They were working together. One was named Ed Wilson. Ed Wilson was in Libya. He was a federal fugitive here, but he lived in Libya, in Tripoli, the capital, and he was providing weapons with Gaddafi's concurrence to the terrorist groups that Gaddafi supported in training camps in the southern deserts of Libya. And the other guy was named Frank Turpel. Frank Turpel, his partner, was in Beirut, and he was providing weapons to the, some of the different militia that were always at odds with one another. In Wilson's case, you couldn't contact the... I, I, I was the guy for ABC who, among other things, covered Libya, so I'd been there a few times. You couldn't contact the Minister of Information by any means but face-to-face. -face. You had to fly down, request whatever you were there to request, and hope that you would get some approval. So a camera crew and I, I was assigned to track these guys down by ABC, try to get an interview, try to tell their story. We knew who they were and what they were doing. And so we flew to Tripoli. I requested their help, the government's help, uh, getting, getting FaceTime with this guy, Ed Wilson. And their response was the typical response whenever you requested anything, including a, an interview with Gaddafi himself. And that was, go to your hotel and wait for a call. Could be a day, could be a week. So we went to our hotel, and it was the second... You don't leave. You, if you leave your room, you call the front desk first and say, if I get any calls, send them to the dining room. Because if you miss the call, you might miss the story. Second night, middle of the night, I got a call. 
saying, be downstairs out front of the hotel in 20 minutes. And I said, can I bring my camera crew? And they said, no, just you. So I was outside, a sedan pulled up, I was blindfolded, I was put in the back seat on the floor behind the front seats, driven around for at least half an hour, you know, left and right and up and down. We never left Tripoli, I knew that for two reasons. Number one, there was noise, and number two, I'd been out of Tripoli and there was no road that went like this. There were just roads straight into the desert. So I knew they just wanted to make sure that I could not memorize the route to where this guy was, if that's where they were taking me. They descended into a, a subterranean garage, I was unblindfolded, put on an elevator, knocked on the door, Ed Wilson opens it, he's like my best friend. And we talked for about half an hour, negotiated an interview for the following night. His only condition was that we would shoot him, videotape him, I shouldn't say shoot him in a situation <laughs> like that. We would videotape him uh, in silhouette because he said to me, as you can imagine, I have a few other passports and I do return to the States. And sometimes, he said he sometimes wears a toupee and so forth. He was a big bear of a man, by the way. He said, I don't want to be walking through the Atlanta airport and with, with respect to everybody here, he said, I don't want some blue-haired lady saying, oh, you're the guy I saw on the news who provides the terrorists with weapons. <laughs> so I agreed to it. He said, okay, tomorrow night. So the next night, we get camera crew now picked up in a van. We're all blindfolded. We're all put on the floor again. We're all driven all over hell and back. And then we end up in his apartment. We shoot the interview. We, we do the interview. And uh, in silhouette, I had explained to the cameraman, he said they could do it. You've seen those things where somebody doesn't want to be identifiable. And we leave. The next day, we're on the first flight out because I kept thinking, what if he changes his mind? What if the government changes their mind? Because it doesn't really reflect well on them that they're, they're uh, hosting him. Uh, so we were on the first flight. It happened to be Libyan Arab Airways. It wasn't BA, British Airways. And I didn't relax until wheels were down in London because the government could have called that airplane back any time short of final approach. But we did land in Libya. I got on the phone, talked to the executive producer of ABC's World News Tonight, as it was called in those days, told them we had it, told them what it was going to look like, and his reaction was, great, that makes it more dramatic. So anyway, we edited the story all day. You have actually until 10.30 or 11 at night, London time, because that's only 5.30 or 6 in New York when the network newscasts go on the air. And so we edited the piece and it was pretty dramatic. It was the lead story. We transmitted it to New York across the lines. And I went home, lived in London. And my wife was used to me getting home late. We had a late dinner and then we went to bed. And then I had my third two in the morning incident. The phone rang. Who here has ever been in London? You know the ring, 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 ring. I mean, it's better than an alarm clock. It's worse than an alarm clock. And I pick up the phone and all I can tell you is, without handing it to my wife, she heard Ed Wilson threatening to kill me. What happened was, he, I mean, he was shouting. And what happened was, the piece was edited. You can't put light, maybe with today's technology you can, but you can't put light into a dark scene. You couldn't at least then. It was early days of videotape. And Wilson was shouting, I said, what, I, you know, when he, he shouted for a good minute, and then I said, I don't know what this is about. He was just shouting that he was going to kill me. And he said, right after the, your, your piece aired, I had friends calling me here saying, oh, Ed, you look great on TV. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't understand what they had seen. I then said, give me an hour. Give me an hour. Let me find out what that happened. I said, it couldn't be our videotape. And I called ABC's office in New York. I told them what happened. I said, you got to track down the guy who's the executive producer of the network newscast, and have him call me as soon as he can. This is serious. He called me back. I told him what happened. He said, I mean, I don't know if he did this, but I could hear him doing it. He said, I know what happened. The art department had come up with a still a color photographs of, of Ed Wilson from some file, and over Peter Jennings' shoulder when he was introducing the story, there was Ed Wilson in living color. So his friends told them that. They didn't say, oh, it was over Jennings. They just saw, we looked at you, you look, we saw you, look, you look great. So anyway, he, 
He was good enough to calm down and he never did kill me. <laughs> he did get caught on a return visit to the United States several years later. He, until he died, he was served time in a federal prison in Atlanta. I couldn't have been happier that he was inside, not outside. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's Frank Turple in Beirut. He's the guy who's providing weapons to different militia. Uh, there, you don't go through any government. You didn't then anyway, probably not even today, because there was really no effective government to work with. There, I went and I started going to the different militia. I had covered the Civil War in Beirut over the years, in and out, and I approached different militia, not hard to find, they find you, until somebody connected me with Frank Turple's number two, also an American, also a CIA spook gone bad, and we arranged indirectly through the militia for a rendezvous at a hotel in East Beirut. <clears throat> Beirut, you might remember learning, there was East and West, and West Beirut was basically Muslim Beirut, East Beirut was Christian Beirut. We arranged to meet at a coffee shop in East Beirut in the Alexandra Hotel. He had asked me what I would wear and told me to bring something to put on the table because he didn't want to walk in and sit down to the rec next to the wrong guy. So I wore the color, I told him what color shirt I would wear and told him what I would bring with me. I got there, sat, this is a long, narrow building with bench seating and no farther than I am from the front row here in the chapel were big floor to ceiling plate glass windows facing the parking lot. So I'm sitting there and this guy walks in carrying a briefcase, a leather briefcase, sits down next to me, introduces himself. We didn't even shake hands. Puts the briefcase down on his left side. I'm on his right side. We ordered coffee and pastries. Just after they came, both of us, our attention was drawn because of our line of sight to three big thugs walking in and they didn't look like they wanted pastry. And sure enough, they walked in and he started screaming. He knew who they were, or at least why they were there. And they reached across the table, pulled him up under both arms, dragged him over the table. The table hit the ground, our pastries hit the ground, our coffee cups shattered on the ground. And by, mind you, this being Beirut during a, an ugly war, everyone else is kind of looking down, you know, studying their croissants, you know, sort of see no evil, hear no evil. They drag him out, he's screaming, no, 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 no. I watch him being dragged through the parking lot until it was out of my line of sight. He was never seen again. So now I'm sitting there. What the hell do I do? If I, 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 and I'm thinking through the possibilities. If I get up and leave right away, maybe I draw attention to myself and that might not be good. I didn't know what it could lead to, but it didn't seem good. Or I sit there like nothing had happened, order another coffee and wait 20 minutes and then go, go dancing out. But then I thought, what if these guys get back to their bosses and say, we got the, this guy, I don't remember his name, number two, but there was somebody with him. And the bosses hit the roof and say, go get him. Why'd you leave him there? So I decided to get up and leave. And then I looked at the briefcase and thought, do I want to take it? Curiosity got the cat. I took the briefcase. Let me tell you this, when I was looking around for, the, for this guy, when I was talking with different militias, we had a bureau in Beirut, you know, every Western news organization did. The Civil War went for on for about 15 years. And we had people based there. I was never based there. And I always vowed I would die with those words on my lips. But we had bodyguards that almost always accompanied us. They were members of the Druze sect, the Druze religion. They were good bodyguards to have because everyone hated them and they hated everybody. So they were great bodyguards. They were, they were tough, tough people. They had suffered a lot. When I got to Beirut and talked to the head of the bodyguards, he said, I want to send somebody with you. I said, no, I can't do what I'm here to do with anybody uh, shadowing me. I've got to do it. So he said, okay. I mean, we argued, but he said, okay. So I spent a couple of days wandering alone around Beirut, talking to militias. So I get up with the briefcase, walk out of the coffee shop, walk into the parking lot and waiting just beyond where I had been able to see were two of these guys. They had been with me every day for the three days I spent arranging this rendezvous. And boy, was I grateful they were. So you get to have these experiences when you live in the, law, in the wrong lane. And they're experiences worth having. What was in the briefcase? 
The briefcase. That's a good question. I took it back to the bureau. I mean, these guys drove me back to the bureau. And I'm holding the briefcase. I sat in front of Shakib. He's the, he's the main bodyguard. And he was a friend. Good guy. And he said, what is that? I said, it belonged to the guy I was meeting with. He said, give it to me. I said, I'm not going to give it to you. The story might be in here. He said, give it to me. You don't want to have it. He knew his way around a whole lot better than I did. One of the smart things you can do when you're a foreign correspondent is listen to anybody who knows more than you do. Because the risks of ignoring their advice are pretty big. So I left him reluctantly, sadly, with the briefcase. And I can't answer the question beyond that. Um, what else? Oh, so I'm talking, I'm talking about adventures. And you have, you know, that was an adventure, that was an adrenaline rush, but it was also a risk. Because you don't go into risky places blind. And risk doesn't just mean uh, when ordnance is flying. It means when there's hostility in the air. So you don't go in and just hope for the best. You calculate your risks. And there are people doing that today. James cited a few war zones, and there are more. And everybody has to do it if they want to survive. So you calculate, how far do I go without going too far? You calculate, how long do I stay without staying too long? You calculate, how far to push without pushing too far? How many rules to break without crossing the line? Now that might apply to walking into a field of bullets. It might also apply to interviewing some of the uh, dictators that people like me had to interview. I've interviewed Yasser Arafat, I've interviewed Muammar Gaddafi, I interviewed Ayatollah Khomeini. Gaddafi's kind of an interesting story when I talk about not wanting to push too far. You're always walking a fine line between trying to ask the questions that have to be asked of people like that and sounding offensive or insulting. So one day, there was a pair of terrorist attacks at two different uh, airports in what was then still Western Europe. And the, in both cases, they shot up lines of people waiting to check in at American, at US airlines. I don't remember whether it was TWA or Pan American, but it was one or both of those. And the death toll was in the 20s. The United States government immediately pointed a finger at Gaddafi for supporting the terrorists who had executed those massacres. I was somewhere in Southern Europe doing some story with a camera crew, and I got, once again, that pager came in handy, and I called the office, and they said, get to Libya. I was the guy who, among other things, covered Libya. And so we chartered a plane, flew into Libya, and as soon as we landed, they thought better of their decision to let us in. We were the first ones, and they cut it off to all other journalists. So I went to the Minister of Information, as I had done to find this guy, Ed Wilson, the, the, uh, the uh, explosive lamp dealer, and said, I want an interview with the leader. And the response is always the same, <laughs> go to your hotel, wait in your room, wait for the call. And it was, again, a couple of days. It's just the way they operated. It was a couple of days, got a call in the middle of the night saying, be outside in 20 minutes. And so I roused the camera crew out of their beds. We got outside. A yellow school bus pulled up, had a few Libyan journalists on it. We got on and we started driving. This is two or three in the morning. I fell asleep. We drove for a long time. We were driving some distance into the countryside, into the desert. And when we stopped, the cameraman shook me awake, Patrick. He said, look, look. And there was a field to our right when we pulled to a stop, a muddy field. It does rain there, and it had. And off in the distance, probably a quarter mile or so, was a tractor flanked by two others on each side. Five tractors in sort of an arrow shape pulling away from us. And then other people running alongside. You couldn't really see much because it was just dawn. But we got out, and the cameraman said, Gaddafi. Oh. So we got out, we ran through the mud, and we're huffing and puffing. We got up to the tractor, and he acted 
surprised to see us. I and mean, the whole thing was obviously a setup. He acted surprised to see us. He stopped the tractor. He didn't turn it off. He just stopped it. And I knew that the camera crew would need a couple of minutes to catch their breath, as I did, and to, you know, get microphone and camera. Cameras in those days were big, heavy affairs uh, in place. And in the meantime, I'm making small talk with Gaddafi. <laughs> small talk is easily defined with a guy like that. And I said, what are you doing? Over the, over the din of the tractor, what are you doing? And he said, I am, he spoke pretty good English, heavily accented, but he had a decent vocabulary. He said, I'm tilling the fields for the people. <laughs> and I said, do you do this a lot? He says, yes, I many times till the fields for the people. About that point, the cameraman gave me a nod, meaning we're ready to do the serious interview. So I said to Gaddafi, we can talk to you about I want to talk to you about the uh, terrorist attacks. He said, yes. I said, would you turn off the tractor? He couldn't find the ignition. This man who tills the field for the people <laughs> couldn't find the ignition to save his life. And one of his aides, one of the runners, all of whom had machine guns, of course, uh, reached over and he said, oh, I always forget where it is. <laughs> so then I was trying to figure out hadn't really given it a great deal of forethought, how to ask the one question I really wanted to ask, which was, did you support the terrorists who attacked the two airports in Europe? At that point, it's three or four days ago. And he paused. Something else you learn doing my job is how to deal with a pause, not that you always do it right. But if you let the pause just sit there, the pregnant pause, too long, then your interview subject could just say, well, that's it. Adios. Thanks for coming. You don't want that to happen. You never get to ask your question. But if the pause comes and you jump in too fast, you might have preempted the chance to hear the answer that he might have given you. So it was probably five or six seconds. It felt truly like five or six minutes but just silence between us. Who's gonna blink first? I was about to blink and open my big fat mouth when he beat me to it just by a fraction of a second and he said, we do not support terrorists, but we do support freedom fighters. <laughs> and I thought, bingo. You know, I didn't have to interpret that for our American audience. Everybody could figure out what he was telling me. So that's part of the fun of living life in the wrong lane, and part of the idea of trying to figure out how far to push without crossing the line. Many of the calculations you make are just guesswork. Sometimes they're educated guesswork, but they're guesswork nevertheless. And sometimes it's not even a matter of guesswork. Sometimes the risk is just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, <laughs> certainly Evan Gersh Gershkovich, who is the Wall Street Journal reporter who, as of this month, has been behind bars in Moscow for a full year. Found that out the hard way. Uh, a journalist friend of mine, a French journalist, worked for a French TV network. Uh, he was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time doing something I myself had done only six weeks, early, not six weeks, six months earlier in Afghanistan. Different trip than the first one on the uh, Afghan DC-10. What I had done with the camera crew was joined up with Mujahideen. You know who they were? They were the, uh, the American allies who then became America's en enemies in the, in the form of the Taliban. But at the time, they were our allies. And we went with them from Peshawar in a lawless city in Afghanistan over the hills into a valley in, uh, in Afghanistan, delivering with a mule train. Mules are donkeys, I'm not quite, I'm from San Francisco. How would I know mules from donkeys? But they were carrying weapons and ammunition and food and water for the warriors in the valley. We were attacked by Soviet uh, helicopter gunships and they did kill a couple of the Mujahideen that were accompanying us. We hid under, there were big stones in this valley, we, we hid under them and I mean all of us, my team, survived. Six months later, this Frenchman, friend of mine, was doing the very same thing with a French camera crew. And he wasn't so lucky. He survived, but they picked him up. They were able to snatch him to make an example of him. So he was taken to Kabul. He was tried for espionage and sentenced to death. 
And he was taken to a prison called Policharki. I had been there on my very first trip. They did a show release of political prisoners, which wasn't real. But it's a dungeon of a prison. It's not, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles outside of Kabul. He was put in a cell there. And he lived to tell the story because he was French. And the French government was able to negotiate his release after about a month. But until then, as he told me over lunch a few months later, every night, there would be a sound of keys in the, in the cell leading into the cell block, and there'd be footsteps going right by his cell, and you'd hear another cell open, you'd hear somebody sometimes screaming, being dragged or marched back out in front of him. A few minutes later, there would be shots, and those people never returned. He lived right, life in the wrong lane, but was lucky to have the nationality he had. If it had been me, the U.S., given our rivalry with the Soviet Union, <clears throat> that never could have happened. Sometimes you make deci deliberate decisions that are just lousy. Uh, this is about the war in Uganda to oust the monster known as Idi Amin. He ruled that nation for, I think it was eight years, and something like one million out of the eight million person population was exterminated in those eight years. It was a small Nazi Germany. And so we wanted to get in there, as did some other Western journalists. But there was no front line, and there was certainly no American support. There was no American army to deal with. So we just had to figure out how to get into Uganda. And the first thing we decided to do, the camera crew and me, uh, was go to a village on the shores of Lake Victoria. A village which, by boat, you could then reach the shores of Uganda. You weren't sure where you were going to come up on the shoreline, but you would be in Uganda. And it was sort of the shortest distance between two points. We started talking with three European journalists, and the six of us concocted a plan to either buy a boat or pay the owner of a boat to take us in the middle of the night across Lake Victoria and Voila, we would show up in Uganda. The camera crew, once again, I say, listen to people wiser and more experienced than you. The camera crew was a little more war-weary than I was in those days. And although they first liked the idea because they were adrenaline junkies, they said, you know, something just seems wrong. We could end up landing in the wrong place. I don't want to do it. And I was barely smart enough to listen to them. So we didn't go. By about 36 hours later, we were flying into Entebbe Airport, the famous Entebbe Airport, with the Tanzanian army. They are the ones who had precipitated the war because they were embarrassed. They were part of something called the East African Economic Community. They were embarrassed by the presence of Idi Amin. Plus, he was killing tourism and so forth. So uh, we ended up going to uh, uh, Western Tanzania, and flew in with the army into Entebbe. Spent two days with them as they fought their way down about 20 miles of road uh, to get to the capital, Kampala, which was a mess. After maybe, probably, it was about two days on the street. You know, we're just, I mean, the war was still going on. And we were out videotaping, recording what we were doing. And a guy came up to me, a Ugandan and said, you are journalists, yes? And I said, yeah. He said, I have a story to tell you. The story he told me was that he was from a village on the shore of Lake Victoria, and these three European journalists had come up on that shoreline at the village. Unfortunately for them, the chief of the village was an ally of Idi Amin. He put them on trial. They were convicted of whatever they were convicted of, and they were shot on the spot. And the villagers were told, leave them where they are. They were wrapped in banana leaves, leave them where they are. Well, this guy, the middle of the night, thought somebody's going to want to know. So he slinked his way over to the bodies, and he got a piece of identification off each one. I really don't remember if they were driver's license, passports. <coughs> Pardon me, but when he showed them to me, as you can infer, these were the three journalists with whom we had come up with the plan to take the boat across. They had gone ahead and done it and paid the ultimate price for it. So sometimes you make awfully bad decisions. Well, with all those risks come rewards. 
I, I, I mentioned the front row seat, first and foremost, because you get to see things that very few people do. You get to see with your own eyes what everyone else, including you, have to hear secondhand or thirdhand from people like me. Um, I mean, I, I've had great experiences with that front row seat. I've covered domestically about half a dozen presidential campaigns. And there, there's, there's nothing better than calculating the character of a presidential candidate by seeing him or her, in my day it was all hymns, uh, you know, day in and day out on the stump. Uh, I got to cover, I was one of the two live reporters for ABC News, along the route from Buckingham Palace to St. Paul's Cathedral for the wedding of Charles and Diana. Peter Jennings and Barbara Walters were the uh, anchors back just outside Buckingham, and then two of us were, you know, the narrators along the way. It was the most exciting day. It didn't turn out to be the most exciting marriage, but it was the most exciting day. I mean, that was a great use of the front row seat. But you also see natural disasters and wars and things that bring, you know, discomforts and dangers that sometimes you might not be able to imagine. Um, but with that comes some very mixed experiences. I've seen, again, the life in the wrong lane that I got to le live brought me both pleasure and agony. I was in Iran during the revolution. I saw the change, I've seen governments change hands, including the Islamic revolution, which turned into a disaster, of course, for the West. Uh, I covered several times the civil war in what was then Rhodesia, became Zimbabwe, uh, for black majority rule. That was also a, a vicious war, but the government changed hands, and although they ended up with Robert Mugabe, who I had been with in the bush, and he was a pretty good guy at the time, but he turned into a pretty vicious dictator himself. But the, the positive transition of government that I got to see was in Bolivia. There was a guy named Evo Morales, and Morales was an indigenous Bolivian. He had no Spanish blood, and he was the first indigenous leader in all of South America. So that, that's what attracted us down there. We even got to go to Lake Titicaca. After I went, my young son loved repeating the name. We got to go to Lake Titicaca. It's up between Bolivia and Peru. It's, it's the highest freshwater navigable lake in, in the world. It's at 12,500 feet, roughly for a blessing ceremony for Evo Morales. And you know, it's just one of those many things, many, many experiences, many adventures that I shall never forget. I've gotten to interview world leaders, good and bad. And that's another front row seat to get a real glimpse into what they're like. I've talked to Margaret Thatcher. I've talked to, to Anwar Sadat. I talked to Indira Gandhi. Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa. He was maybe the most riveting interview I ever did. We were there shooting a piece about, I don't know, maybe it was 20 years after the, the, uh, the change of government and the end of apartheid. And one of the questions I asked him was, I mean, he was universally admired and with good reason. I asked him, how is it that after all the years of dreaming of a better South Africa for its majority, that it hasn't really materialized in, in, in concert with your dreams. And he laughed and he filled the room with laughter. That's what he was like. And he said, how naive we were to think that just because of the color of our skin, we were less vulnerable to corruption, less vulnerable to crime, less vulnerable to greed than the people who used to run us and oppress us. It was a great interview. But then again, I also interviewed Yasser Arafat many times and Muammar Gaddafi a few times and, uh, and even Ayatollah Khomeini. Interesting thing about Khomeini, he, sh he put out his hand to shake hands. He had a hand like a wet fish. I mean, here he commanded the love and loyalty of millions and I mean, it just wasn't a part of his culture. It just wasn't a part of his culture. Um, I mentioned the adrenaline rush. Well, getting chased by a gang with machetes, I, I, I need say no more. Did a piece about the Colombian drug war. And we, just a cameraman and I were down there doing it. The Colombian drug army is, they're called the Colombian drug police, but they're an army. They look like army. They are outfitted from tanks to lip balm by the United States of America to try to eliminate uh, you know, the production of cocaine. 
And so we went down, we spent about a week there, and one day we went out with the, the drug police on, on uh, two Black Hawk helicopters. And the cameraman and I, to, oh, to, what happens is they have fixed wing aircraft that fly over the jungle and if they get, pick up a heat signature, that means somebody's boiling something down below. It's a cocaine lab. And so they have coordinates where the light aircraft has detected heat. And then these two Blackhawks go in. In this case, he and I are in one of them. And they seated us on the exterior bench. You were outside the helicopter, strapped in, of course, on either side of the machine gunner. So there are two helicopters. One contains troops, one contains, ours contains some troops and us. Here's how it works. They know where they're going and they have already identified, the aircraft has, a landing zone, meaning the, the, the nearest opening where they weren't going to land on a tree. And while we're in the air, the other helicopter lands and our machine gunner sprays the periphery of the landing zone to keep the bad guys who clearly heard us coming and would have run in some direction from attacking the troops getting out of the helicopter. Then he takes off, we land, and he does the same thing for us. We've got a captain of the drug police in charge of the two of us, and we go running after the soldiers. Sometimes they're hacking their way, it was probably a good quarter to half a mile, hacking their way through the trees to get to the drug lab, and then there it was. We were there about 15 minutes, they're setting explosives, because that's what they do. They make it go kaboom. Doesn't mean they won't build another one the next day, and they do somewhere else, but at least they eliminate this one, which is already productive. So they're setting the explosives when a soldier comes running back from the periphery of the drug lab saying, they're coming back and they're armed. I mean, in Spanish, but the captain was bilingual. He said, we gotta go. And we all go running. I told you, this is about an adrenaline rush. You don't think about what, what trouble you're in uh, until later. And we all go running back and sure enough, we get on one helicopter, the other one sprays the periphery, we take off and then we spray the periphery. And then the captain says to us, look out your right hand uh, side, and that's where we were, and there was a huge explosion. The drug lab was history. Well, the cameraman and I, his name is Jim Van Franken, he lives in Denver. We couldn't talk to each other, we're outside the helicopter, it's kind of noisy. We flew for about 15 minutes back to a forward base and landed. We both got off, as you do from a helicopter, you get out from under the rotors, and then they shut it down. His first words to me, this is a guy who loves having his adrenaline pumping hard. His first words, and I shouldn't really, I actually checked with Dale Mosier, the chairman of Vail Symposium last night, said, can I give this quote? He said, yeah, because we're in a chapel. I don't want lightning to strike me down. But his first word to me was, first words were, I wouldn't miss that shit for anything. <laughs> That's an adrenaline junkie. And you've gotta be an adrenaline junkie to live life in the wrong lane. Um, satisfaction of beating the bad guys at their own game. You know, some of these places you go, and again, it's happening today, the authorities put up every possible barrier to you succeeding in your mission, which is to tell the story of whatever you went there to report. Some places they don't let you in, but if they let you in, they still do that. I don't, I've never understood why they let you in, but they do. So in two cases, I walked away with extreme satisfaction. One was in Moscow. It was on December 10th. The reason I remember the date is that every year, the United Nations declares International Human Rights Day on December 10th. I was in Moscow. I was filling in for a couple of weeks, as I periodically did, for our correspondent who would go on vacation or maybe was covering some story elsewhere in the country. And on December 10th, I was in our bureau. Everybody had bureaus in Moscow in the Soviet days. On December 10th, the bureau got a call and one of our Russian staffers answered it. And she reported to me what the call had said, which was basically, it is International Human Rights Day. No, no self-identification. It's International Human Rights Day. Be at Pushkin Square before dark. Now, Pushkin Square, right in the middle of the commercial and retail section of Moscow. It's not half a mile up from the Kremlin on Gorky Street. And so we didn't know what it was about, but he said it's International Human Rights Day, be there before dark, so we were. And so were the other three networks. CNN was still fairly new. This is early or mid-80s. 
It was still fairly new, but the four American networks were there, a couple of British networks. It was snowing, it's December, for God's sake, in Moscow, snowing like crazy. Nobody, it's, it's rush hour, it's before dark in December. People are huddled under awnings and under overhangs. Nobody is standing out in the snow waiting for their bus. The only people standing out in the snow had an inch or two on their shoulders. They were all wearing the same thing. They were all men. They were all wearing the same overcoat and the same government issue steel-toed boots, KGB. They too had gotten word that there would be some sort of observation about International Human Rights Day. So we, you know, we all calculated that pretty fast. So we're standing out there too and we're staring at each other. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Everybody knows we're going to be on different sides of whatever does happen. And sure enough, at a certain point, nobody even noticed at first, a woman steps out of the queue to get on the, 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 the you know what a queue is, to get on the bus. She steps out, walks up to the statue of Pushkin in Pushkin Square, begins to lay a single flower at the base but before she even drops it, two of these guys take her by the arms, one more by the legs, and they trundle her off. Hardly saw it happen. But before long, another guy comes out of the crowd of commuters with a flower, does the same thing, they trundle him off. By the third or fourth, we're turning on our cameras and pulling out our notebooks because we begin to see what's happening. Eventually, fifth or sixth one, the KGB guys decide they don't like seeing us there. They don't like being seen by our cameras. So they start grabbing our cameras. They pulled NBC's camera off and threw it to the ground. CBS's camera broke, and one of these KGB guys put his steel-toed boot right through the lens. ABC's camera was the only one that survived, just by stroke of dumb luck. Our cameraman was pretty tough. They were grabbing at him, but he held on to it. So we got back to our bureaus. They were all on two floors in the same building. They kept all journalists in the same place about a mile from the Kremlin. And we went outside. You didn't want to talk in your bureau because you knew they were bugged. And we, we had looked, I had looked at our footage and sure enough, we had this whole thing on video. We, 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 we could document the way the Soviets celebrated International Human Rights Day. And I said, you know what? Let's, something we had done once before, let's send in coded language to our respective offices in the United States that ABC's footage survived. We're going to find a way to transmit it to the United States and, and everybody. I, I personally said, I want everybody to be able to use it or I won't do it. And they all agreed and their, their bosses ultimately agreed as well in, in New York. But how do we transmit it that night? Well, there are different ways that censors operate in different countries. Some want to see everything you've done before you ever send it out. Sometimes just they want to look at the video cassettes, even if you're not transmitting from the national TV facility, they want to look at the video cassettes and they'll take them from you uh, before you leave the country. But in the, in the case of, of uh, the Soviet Union, we would apply for 15 or 20 minutes of satellite time from the uh, Soviet television headquarters. There was something called the International Control Room, and they had censors who were, who were uh, bilingual. So there was an English-speaking censor for people like us, there was a German-speaking, Spanish, uh, French, and so forth. So in this case, we had the English-speaking censor. But still, how are we gonna, and what she would do, the moment she sees or hears something that is verboten, whack, cut off the transmission. So you can't just put in the videotape and start feeding it out, showing these KGB thugs at work. Well, earlier that day, Gorbachev was meeting with the American Commerce Secretary, a, a guy named Maurice Stans. Don't ask me why I remember his name. I need a data dump. He was meeting with the U.S. Commerce Secretary. And we went, mainly because I had never been in the same room with Gorbachev before. I wanted to see the guy up close. And it was a photo op. We were in there for about five minutes. You know, the camera was running all the time, just shooting the photo op. We never intended to use it. But now this thing happened at, uh, in Pushkin Square. So I came up with an idea. <coughs> Pardon me. Along with our editor, who was an American, oh, I should tell you, maybe I'm giving it away. He was a former army explosives expert. 
our, ed our American editor based in Moscow. The idea was, I would put together a story, beginning with maybe 30 seconds, I would write a narrative about this productive meeting about trade between the Soviets and the Americans, and that was to lull the censor into a false sense of security. And then about 30 seconds in, what the, what the editor told me was, I can build a small explosive device, just a small one, behind the, uh, the, the counter where the censor and the, uh, the technical director sat. There were different boards. You've seen them in the movies with cords going in and out all over the place. He said, I'll go back one panel's worth and I'll set the explosive and I'll just stand there. And at about the 25 second mark, while they're still watching you talking about the meeting between Gorbachev and Stans, I'll set off the explosive. Well, he got it wrong. It was much bigger than he had planned. The whole place <laughs> caught on fire. And we all went running, <laughs> including the censor, including the technical director. They didn't take the time to shut off. I mean, all of a sudden, an explosion, they just went running. The piece got through. That's called beating the bad guys at their own game. <laughs> um, another one was in Afghanistan. First trip. The time we flew in on that DC-10. In places like that, I mean, we, we didn't even have an American ambassador. We had an embassy, but low-level representation and very small. The American ambassador only a year earlier had been assassinated, and strangely enough, nobody wanted to replace him. <laughs> and so I went around just to get the lay of the land and talk to ambassadors from countries that did not necessarily have a direct interest. And one was the Saudi ambassador, and he was very nice. He had his own employees driving up and down some of the highways in that part of Afghanistan just to tell him what they saw. What he had been told was that the Soviets were flying tons of aircraft, almost no space between one landing and another, uh, into the Bagram Air Base. Now, you've all heard that name or read it because that became the main American air base during our war in Afghanistan. But at this point, the Soviets have taken it over and they're flying things in. And I wanted to know what they were bringing in. So we did the only thing you could do. When we had landed in that DC-10, the 12 journalists or so on the plane were all met together. They knew we were coming. And we were taken to the Ministry of Information before we ever got to a hotel. And we were told by the Minister of Information, who was now Soviet, that there were only three rules. Number one, you cannot leave Kabul. Number two, um, uh, you cannot go out without a government minder, you know, a, a government escort. And number three, you can't say anything bad about the Soviet Union. So when they give you those ground rules, you know you're going to have to break one or two. So we did something Dan Rather subsequently did for CBS. He got a lot of press because he was Dan Rather. He got to be called Gunga Din. But we did the same thing. In the hotel, which has a bilingual staff, of course, because it was called the Intercontinental Hotel, owned by Pan American, as a matter of fact. Uh, they had a bilingual staff. We paid busboys and, and uh, room maids who were male to um, do two things. Number one, bring us local clothing, their own clothing. We would buy it from them at a high price. It wasn't worth it. And number two, to arrange for a taxi to meet us the next morning at daybreak. <coughs> Pardon me at a back door of the hotel through the kitchen where we would, they would, he would, they, they would have explained to the taxi driver that we wanted to go to Bagram, how long we wanted to stay, and then to bring us back. And so we, they brought the clothing. We actually smudged a little dirt on our faces. Not that we wouldn't otherwise be obvious, but we did our best to fit in. We got into the taxi. He knew where to go. Everyone was, he's, he didn't speak a word of English. We, of course, didn't speak his language, but he would stop and make it clear that he wanted a few more dollars or Deutschmarks. We had both. So we'd peel off a few, most expensive taxi ride I ever took. We got to Bagram. He dropped us. I said, you know, pointed to my watch three, and he nodded yes. And we just lay down in the grass, and we documented on video this endless stream of aircraft, and we could see, we were close enough that we could see th things unloading. We saw tanks and armored personnel carriers. Gave me what I wanted. Trouble was, on the way back into town, there was a roadblock. And we were stopped and couldn't explain ourselves. We had broken the rules. And so they led us back to our hotel, insisted, these were Soviets, insisted that we show them the videos that we had taken. Beating the bad guys at their own game. 
The cameraman, there was a cameraman and a sound man in me. The cameraman, a Brit, we usually carried backup equipment for almost everything. We didn't have Radio Shack in some of these places to buy a new tape recorder. Tape recorders were big affairs at that time that the sound technician literally had to bear over his or her shoulder. And so the cameraman set up not just the tape recorder we had with us, but the backup, and he ran a line from one to the other. These Soviet thugs didn't have a clue what he was doing. And while he was showing them the videotapes, which sure enough had forbidden material on them, he was recording it on a new videotape, <laughs> which ended up being spooled, we'd done this before in other places, spooled onto a lead pencil into something about this big, and that's how it left the country. I left the country too, I was expelled, but I'll tell you, that was the best expulsion I ever suffered. <laughs> I was expelled from Moscow, from, from that uh, story I told you as well. But, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've, I've been arrested, I've been jailed, one time was legitimate, one was not. Northern Ireland, during the Troubles, the IRA and the Brits and so forth. Um, do you remember the hunger strikers in Northern Ireland? These were IRA terrorists who went on strike, wouldn't put on clothes, smeared their feces on the walls of their cells, and wouldn't take food or water. You can live a long time if you just take water. But they, they turned into shriveled. I saw the very first one who died. I went to his wake. Bobby Sands was his name. And he was, I mean, he probably weighed 60, 70 pounds. I, just, I didn't go to honor him. I went to see him. Uh, but the night he died, there were riots all over West Belfast. That was the Catholic side of Belfast. And we were out there covering it all night. And shortly before dawn, the camera crew and I heard an explosion and saw a flash from somewhere around a corner. We ran around the corner, and there was a three-wheeled, fairly typical in Britain, three-wheeled milk cart, milk truck, delivered milk and butter and I guess a few other things to people's homes. And slumped over the wheel, dead, was the driver, the milkman. Slumped over, there was a two-person seat. Next to him was his son, who we subsequently learned, I didn't know it was his son, but learned he had gone with his dad because he knew that there were riots in the streets. He wanted to help protect him. They both died. The police showed up 30 seconds after we did, immediately put two and two together and came up with five. Said we, because there were, there were Molotov cocktails still flying around. He said, we had paid somebody to throw the Molotov cocktail to get a good story. We were arrested, we were put in jail. I was denounced the next day, by the way, in the British Parliament. Kind of an honor, but I lived in London, so it wasn't really that good a time. But we were put in jail. The next day, thankfully, eyewitnesses came and refuted the police officer's story, said they had been there on the block and they had seen, we hadn't done it. But that's all part of <laughs> life in the wrong lane. Um, Exposure is another reward I think I mentioned to you at the beginning. That means exposure, well, to all kinds of things. Exposure to just how lucky we Americans are. Being born where we were born and living the way we live because people all over the world aren't nearly as lucky. It's also exposure to that human condition. And when I, th when I think of those words, I think particularly of one of the saddest things I ever saw. It was after an earthquake in in North Yemen, it used to be North and South, now they're unified, but North Yemen. And uh, about 2,000 people died. It was a big, bad earthquake. And we uh, chartered to, to uh, Sa'na, which was the capital of North Yemen. And you know, you, you land, and then what do I do next? Uh, one of us went to the US Embassy, which was a building built of mud, like almost all buildings, you know, baked hard in the sun, even in the capital of the country. And the other one, which was me, went to the foreign ministry. And I was the one who lucked out. We were just looking for a way to get to the earthquake zone, which was a good 200 miles away. And at the foreign ministry, they said, you guys go to, they told us about an army base where helicopters were going back and forth from the earthquake zone with uh, search dogs and you know, water and food and blankets. Typical fare that goes into an earthquake. And so we went out to the zone and the general in charge of the, the, uh, the base had gotten a call that we were coming. He was very hospitable, 
but there was no helicopter yet, so he sat us down and served us a meal on the tarmac, which was very nice, and all of a sudden a helicopter comes. Now, I've got to back up and tell you this. While we were flying to Yemen from Paris, I had grabbed from my file cabinet, I lived in Paris at the time, my file on Yemen. Now, I had a file on Belgium that had 100 articles. I had a file on, <laughs> you know, a lot of places that was too thick to read. I didn't have a whole lot of pieces about Yemen because very few people had ever reported from Yemen. I had five clippings, I still remember. Every one of them, even though some were about the economy and some were about the politics, every one of them had a little bit of travel log in it too because Yemen was a very primitive and exotic place. And not a single writer had failed to mention that at lunchtime, all the men have chins as, as green as the forest primeval because they all chewed on a local weed called cot, K-H-A-T, cot, which rhymes with pot, because it's like pot. It, it, it gives them a high. So anyway, helicopter arrives. I said to the crew, I mean, the general has disappeared. I said, I'm gonna go ask the pilots if, if, we can, if they'll let us hitch a ride down to the earthquake zone. And I get on, and there's a, a curtain separating the flight deck from the cargo deck. And so I separate the curtains, you know, the division is in the middle, and I say, Salam Alaikum, which is hello. And the pilots turn toward me, both turn inward toward me. They both had chins as green as the forest primeval. <laughs> Cot, you know, it rhymes with pot. But they had landed, I watched them land just out of curiosity. They'd landed smoothly, they'd done a few missions. So I went back and told the crew, they said, yeah, let's go. So we, we went to the earthquake zone. It was raining like crazy. It was a hilly part of North Yemen. And we came to a pile of rubble, mainly stones, and there was a small group of men digging through the stones, screaming, and one of them finally, we, you know, we're videotaping it, pulls out a young boy, probably six or seven, who was dead placed him in the arms of the, another, another of the men who was digging, who started weeping like he would never stop. Now, I remember thinking, I'm going to be back in Paris in three or four days. He will never leave here. He has lost everything, and he'll never get it back. So exposure to the human condition is a great privilege, but it's not always a great joy. Uh, I got paid for being curious. How good is that? I mean, everyone in this room, everyone on this planet has a natural innate sense of curiosity, don't you? I got paid to follow it up, to follow my nose. And that's what journalists get to do. And when you're in the wrong lane, you get to find out things that even most journalists don't get to find out just because it's just a little too risky to go. Finally, I, I mentioned adventure earlier. Two adventures I want to tell you about. Raise your hands, please, if you've ever been through the Panama Canal. Okay, quite a few of you. Now keep your hands up if you have ever piloted a cargo carrier more than three football fields long through the Panama Canal. <laughs> hands up. It's during a story about Panama, thinking about widening the locks to let in the super tankers and the, you know, the, the huge new cargo ships. And at a certain point, when we, we were put from a launch onto this cargo ship, which was steaming in from the Pacific, at a certain point, we'd shot everything, videotaped everything we had to videotape. And I asked the captain, who, the pilot, every ship, once it enters the canal, acquires a Panamanian pilot. The, sh the captain of the ship is no longer in charge. I mean, they're working together, but they're Panamanian pilots. And I asked him, could I take the wheel just long enough for the cameraman to take a picture of me so I can show it to my family? He said, for, I said, for 10 seconds. He said, do it for 10 minutes. So I did. It was a great big wheel. And I said, just for fun, what if I did this? And he said, go ahead. I said, not really. He said, go ahead. So I started. I mean, we're in a, in, a, in a section that's called uh, the cunabra, I think is the Spanish word. It means snake. You speak Spanish. Is that right? Cunebra. I was close. Cunebra. Um, so it, it winds around, and he said, and I started turning it slowly. He said, no, 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 do it, do it like this. <laughs> really? Yes. So I did it like that. Nothing happened. 
This ship is more than 900 feet long. Takes a while to respond to the rudder. And then he said to me, okay, now put it back. <laughs> that was a great adventure. <laughs> Air Force One. I, for three presidencies, I was, I was not a White House correspondent, but I was sec seconded as the third White House correspondent for foreign trips for, uh, for Carter, for Reagan, and for George H.W. Bush. And there is no experience to parallel that of flying on Air Force One because of what happens when you're on the ground. You know, the tail of Air Force One has flags on both sides, and at night, they're illuminated. And your heart beats a little faster with a sense of patriotism and pride and that feeling of good luck that you are associated with the nation whose flag is painted on the tail. And one time, as a matter of fact, we landed in some third world country and I got off the plane. Much of the time you fly on the press plane, but sometimes you're the pool reporter and that's done by lottery. And I was on Air Force One. I got off and I went up to what they call the rope line. You've heard of that. That's where spectators stand to see the president. In this case, I went up to a woman. First woman I went up to and I asked her, do you speak English? Yes. Why did you come out here tonight? It was nighttime. And she said, because I figured this would be the closest I would ever get to the United States of America. <laughs> My heart went even faster. The living life in the wrong lane is about trade-offs. It's a, a series of trade-offs. I can use, I was thinking about it this morning. I'm going to use sleep as a metaphor. I have slept on the hot, rough asphalt on the shoulder of the road of the main highway that snakes through Nicaragua. I have slept on the sands of Saudi Arabia, and I don't even mean with a ground cloth, on the sand with scorpions popping up every now and then. I say slept very loosely in that case. The war with Idi Amin. When we got, I told you that we, we, we eventually ended up in the capital, Kampala. There was a high-rise hotel that it, called the National Hotel that had shut down years earlier because there was no more tourism. There was no more commercial business being conducted in Kampala, and it had shut down. So the Tanzanian army got there, and they, they broke into the hotel, and they assigned the top two floors, and it was an 18 or 19-story building, to the journalists, not to give us a good view. But because, and, the, and the officers and the non-coms, they took the lower floors. But because the electricity had been knocked out the first or second day of the war. So the only way to get up and down from your room was in this windowless, concrete fire stairwell. I can guarantee you that every morning when you left your room, you made double sure you hadn't left anything behind. But when we got up to the room, and they, they assigned them, just like you're checking into a nice hotel, uh, they paired me with a, a British correspondent named John Snow. And we got up to the room, and it was a time warp. Whoever had last slept in the room two or three years earlier, when they, whenever the hotel got abandoned, you know, they just walked out. I mean, the beds were filthy but unmade. The toilet had dried feces in it. This was not the Ritz. But the worst thing about the room was that the hotel was infested with cockroaches and rats. <laughs> this is the cost of living in the wrong lane. And, you know, you just learn to sort of overcome your fear or whatever you call it. But you'd lie down on the bed and every, it wasn't a swarm of cockroaches, but you'd, have a co you'd feel a cockroach crawling along, uh, crawl, you know, over your arm or something. Now, I always wore in those places these boots that had waffle soles. You know what those are? Got the indentations. So that's what I had. So I would lie on the bed, getting my rest, if not my sleep, holding the toe of the shoe, and every time I felt a cockroach, whack, <laughs> whack. And the trouble is half of them survived because the indentation would come down on top of them. <laughs> But those are the kinds of places I've slept. But I've also, I talk about trade-offs, I've slept with a view of the glittering Hong Kong Harbor. And I've slept with a view of Cape Town's uh, Table Mountain. And I've slept with a view of the Kremlin from the National Hotel, which is right across from Red Square. And before I moved to Paris, I slept in the Hotel Crillon, which my room in front overlooked the magnificent uh, Place de la Concorde with its Egyptian obelisk. 
So that was the trade-off. And to me, one was worth the other. Uh, you have dark experiences, but you also have wonderful experiences living in the wrong lane. You see people whose lives are improving by whatever it is you went there to cover. Uh, we went to Nicaragua. There's a different time than when I slept on the asphalt. And we were doing a story, a benign story about fair... What time is it, by the way? We've got about 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. we're, we're fair trade going. coffee. I'll just tell you one of these stories. And we were working with this one farmer up in the hills of northern Nicaragua because marijuana and coffee both grow in the roughest conditions, so that's where he was growing his coffee. And by, by engaging with this new fair trade uh, food system, they cut out the middleman. And he was now making, instead of about $350 of buying power a year, he was making about $500. And I asked him through a translator, and this was an uneducated man, I said, what difference does that make in your life? And he said, my children can go to school. Children had to have shoes to go to school. His children didn't have them. They had to have notebooks and pencils to go to school. His children didn't have them. But because of this, this addition of $150 to his family budget, his children could go to school. In Vietnam, because of Agent Orange, I did a documentary about the legacy of Agent Orange, which is horrible rates of cancer where it was sprayed, horrible birth defects, horrible levels of mental retardation. We spent time with one woman in a very small, rough, poor house where she had grown up in, uh, in, uh, in Da Nang, which is where Agent Orange was staged. A lot of American servicemen suffered some of the same problems. And she was so proud to show us that the government recently had provided those huge sort of water cooler bottles for every household in Da Nang, or at least near the air base in Da Nang where most of the Agent Orange, you know, Agent Orange was dioxin. It's what we call Roundup when we spray our weeds, but it was, it was done to defoliate the trees and see the enemy going south, but it also had horrible effects. I saw birth defects at a hospital in Saigon I'll never forget and wish I could. But... She was very proud to show us that. It had made her life better. I mean, the other side of the story is she invited us to have soup with her and her daughter. She had cancer herself and she didn't have long to live. And so after showing us this fresh water, knowing how good it was for her, she had some greens in her little kitchen. She went out to this patch of land behind her house, dipped them in the old well that she wasn't supposed to use anymore, swirled them around to wash them and then cooked them for the soup. Um, the last story I'm going to tell you is this. I mean, I, for me, I had the greatest career in the world. My wife might not agree. Um, her name is Carol, and some of you in this room know her. Uh, how would you like to have a dinner party planned at your beautiful apartment overlooking the River Seine and the Eiffel Tower in Paris and have all the guests arrive except your husband? <laughs> Carol called the office, said, do you know where Greg is? Pierre Salinger was our bureau chief, the former press secretary to Kennedy. And he said, didn't anybody call you? <laughs> it kind of fell through the cracks. I was on my way to Sudan, where there was an attempted coup. Um, she once flew to Frankfurt, where I was going to be for several days with our then less than two-month-old son, because, you know, to, just to spend time together. But while she was in the air, I was in a charter jet heading to Italy, to the Apennine Mountains, where another earthquake had struck, also killing about 2,000 people. That's what it's like to be the spouse of a guy who, or, or of a correspondent who lives life in the wrong lane. The best story for Carol, not her best story, but the best story about being the spouse. She's the heroine of my career. Somebody asked me earlier uh, uh, about my wife being married to me, and I said, if she weren't as good a woman as she is, we wouldn't have stayed married. I mean, first of all, she had to hear that I was killed in Iran during the revolution, but she was told gently and, and it was quickly overcome. But, um, on that trip into Uganda, when we were still in the village on the shore of Lake Victoria, there was a general store, and he had the only phone in the village. And I made a call to ABC News in New York to tell them, at that time we, were thought, we still thought we were going in on the boat. I said, we're going to disappear for a few days, but uh, you know, we'll let you know as soon as we're out. Turned out to be 10 days. But I talked to the switchboard at ABC, I mean, to the office at ABC, and then asked the switchboard operator, which is the, the, uh, the, uh, the norm, would you please connect me with my home in London? And so now my call is going from this village on the shore of Lake Victoria 
somewhere to Nairobi probably, and then across the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic. Now it's crossing the Atlantic a second time. So I heard the phone ring. This was about two in the morning. Kenya and uh, London are in the same time zone. And I could hear Carol answer, but just barely. I mean, this is a really rough phone call. And I heard her say, hello? And I shouted, I'm not gonna do it to you, but I shouted, Carol, it's me. And she's shouting back, but it's all in whispers on both ends. And I just told her very quickly that we would be out of touch for a while, not the first time she had heard that. And she said, wait a minute, I have a question. And I said, what? And she said, how would you like to see my father? Now her father was in the contracting business in Kansas City. Why she was asking me that, I didn't know. I said, what? She says, how would you like to, at that point, whack. The line goes dead. I can't call her again. It had been six hours waiting for the call to go through. We ended up leaving, getting in another way. When we got out, I think it was to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, I called her before I even called the office. It had stuck with me that whole time. What was she talking about? And she laughed and said, no, no, no. I was asking you, how would you like to be a father? <laughs> and Carol held on to that when she had learned she was pregnant, didn't tell her parents, didn't tell mine, didn't tell her siblings. She wanted me to know first, and that was the penalty she suffered. She had to wait that long. So I loved my career. My wife sometimes did, sometimes didn't, but she's not here, so I'll just say it was great, and thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I'd say you picked the right career, my Did friend. Did I use up the Q&A time? A, a little, but we'll do a few. Oh, okay. Uh, I think you'll all agree you picked the right career, yeah. right? Uh, I was going to plug this at the end. I'll plug it now. Greg has a sub stack where he's writing about current events. Uh, and he cranked out a few articles right behind major headlines. And I called him up and said, had you been writing those for months? Have you been just waiting for the headline to hit? And he said, no, no, I found out about it just like you did. And I said, well, how did you write a whole beautiful story with narrative threads and citing sources in it, what felt like five minutes? He said, James, I've been doing this a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah, everyone has some skill set. Maybe that's mine. So I would encourage you to check out gregdobbs.substack.com. Um, Thank you. We'll take a couple of questions here in the room. I've got one online. I wonder if you could make a quick comment. Do you think I'm capable of a quick uh, Well, here's hoping, because I've got a few questions. But um, can you comment on the Israel restrictions on the press getting into Gaza? Yeah, I think it's horrible. And I think it's to Israel's disadvantage because, you know, the more information that's out there, the more people are going to understand Israel's point of view, because Israel is the one who's not telling the whole story. The story they tell is, we've got to eliminate Hamas personally, I support that. Hamas is the one that attacked them. And they, and they will be attacked again, because they're gonna be attacked again anyway because they're creating so many future terrorists. You know, terrorism breeds in places like that where people lose their homes and they lose their families, they lose their living. Terrorist group adopts them, gives them purpose, like those two young men who held machine guns to my head. They felt power they never otherwise would have felt. So I think it's, it's, it's it's not smart on Israel's part, and we therefore don't also have the full story. Questions in the room? I have one online if you, okay, we got one. Greg, thanks so much. Could you just comment again briefly, I know that's not your forte, but um, if you think about your time as a journalist, you talked about three networks, then CNN, and now we've got 24 seven. What's the difference? What do you think? Do you still think the major networks are getting it right? Do you think they have too much pressure to, you know, try to stay on top of it in another way? Um, I think they're not getting it right. You know, they all have smaller staffs. In our heyday at ABC, and it was the same at CBS and NBC, we had roughly 120 correspondents around the world, around the country and around the world. Now it's maybe 10 to 20 percent of that which means you don't have the full coverage, you don't have the awareness of what's going on in other places uh, uh, because we don't have people in those places anymore. We used to cover the major world capitals, we had at least somebody on every continent but Antarctica, and now we don't. So number one, we don't know what's brewing in those places. Number two, smaller staffs don't just mean fewer correspondents, <clears throat> it means fewer fact checkers, it means fewer editors. 
It means fewer people to make sure they're getting it right. And next, you mentioned all the core, you said 24 seven. The emphasis for many years now, sadly, is more on getting it first than getting it right. And, and I'm saddened by that. But the, ex, the simple explanation, not an excuse, but an explanation for all that is <coughs> that as, <coughs> pardon me, as, as the internet came along, you know, the, the, the total pie of people who wanted to, wanted to follow the news used to be divided between a few major publications and a few major networks. And now there are a hundred slices of that pie. So everybody's ad revenue is lower. And with the lower ad revenue, staffs have been cut back. The cutbacks continue to this very day, major and minor news organizations alike. We have another online question. How do you wrestle with those moments where you are a reporter and someone is in need of assistance and you have to make a choice to provide assistance or not to provide assistance in that capacity I've, as a reporter? I've, I've stopped being the reporter and started being the human being, just a handful of times. But if there's somebody else around to do the same thing you would like to do, you let them do it, because you also have a job to do. And you can't, you know, if, it, if it's a bad place and bad things are happening to people, you can't let it make you dysfunctional. I mean, if you, if you walk away and you're not affected at all, you're not normal. But if it makes you dysfunctional, you can't work. So, you know, you, you have to sympathize, or sometimes it's empathize, depending if you've suffered something similar, but at the same time, you have to do your job. So if there's no one else to help, I have done it. Other questions in the room? Yeah. You're getting in your 10,000 steps. <laughs> Um, as someone who's been in the media business... I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Okay, someone who's been in the media business and also now... I, I apologize. I'm hard of hearing. Come a little oh. closer, okay? Maybe I need to come closer. As if that will bring the speakers any closer. Uh, so, someone that's been in the media business and also in the mental health field, I'm curious how, through your career, when you've been in these extreme situations, maybe when you get home, how do you work with that? How have you worked with losing colleagues and everything that you've experienced over the years? Well, first of all, it would have happened with or without me there. So I don't think, to, I've, I've never, well, in my adult life said, I wish or I worry about. What's gonna happen is gonna happen. How do you deal with it? Kind of what I said a minute ago. I mean, there are reporters just like soldiers, just like firefighters, who come home with PTSD. Now, I don't know what distinguishes some of us from others. I just never did. Uh, I've killed people in Beirut. I killed people. Because if I didn't kill them, they were gonna kill me. I picked up a gun from a dead fighter and killed them. I didn't lose a moment's sleep. Maybe I shouldn't admit that. But, you know, first of all, they were bad guys. And secondly, they were bad guys coming after me. So why should I be concerned? I mean, yeah, they, they left behind families, but you know, they were members of, a, of an ugly militia. Anyway, that, that's the best I can answer that question. We got a few for you, Greg, and then we'll wrap. Uh, did you ever file a report that had a big positive effect on the outcome of the situation? Yeah. I'm not sure I can think of anything overseas. Can I tell you a quick story? <laughs> can I tell a quick story? Um, George McGovern, when he was nominated in 1972, it was one of my first political assignments, I was at the convention in Miami, and he had chosen the night, on the last night of the convention, Tom Eagleton, senator from Missouri, to be his running mate. Within days, a columnist named Jack Anderson, who had been a protege of a columnist named Drew Pearson. You date yourself if you remember those names. But Jack Anderson wrote a column saying that he had it on good authority that Tom Eagleton had two problems. Number one, a DUI in Missouri uh, with an injury. And number two, that he had had electroshock therapy. So ABC sent me, I was, I was actually a producer, I wasn't a correspondent yet with ABC. They sent me to, what's the capital, Columbia? Jefferson, Jeff City, Jefferson. Jefferson City, Missouri. Just to see what I could find out. And I spent a few days, uh, probably just two days, and I paid a lot of people under the table to look at records you shouldn't see. 
I came away with the conclusion that it wasn't, the electroshock therapy was true, but that the DUI, which was really the more damning, was not true. I called the executive producer from Jefferson City of the ABC Evening News in those days, and I said, I think we should do a report that says it, it's not true. And he questioned me a lot. I convinced him. That night, we said that. I mean, the whole world was condemning McGovern for, and, and Eagleton. And it was not true. The next day, Jack Anderson, having seen the report, put out a column saying, mea culpa. He said, I took the word of a highway patrolman who I then contacted after the report, and he told me, well, I didn't know it firsthand. Somebody told me about the DUI. Now, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, I would call that a positive outcome, because <laughs> it helped unsully the man's reputation. So I'm mindful of time in the storm, but I also know we have questions, so <clears throat> we'll do two more, and then we'll close. And I apologize for going on too long. <laughs> what a remarkable career. Thanks for being here I, I'm going to come closer because, I, as I said, it's hard to hear. Once you get there, you'll hear the speaker. What a remarkable career, and thanks for sharing it with us today. I, I, I told you, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Where do you see the future of news broadcasting going with the lower attrition of you know, viewership with the major networks? and much higher attendance of uh, podcasts. Um, there seems to be... Uh, you know, podcasts are, sometimes they're informational, sometimes they're opinion. And uh, I mean, those are going to multiply because they're actually turned out, turning out, some of them, to be big money makers. Right. Uh, the networks, I, I can only say what I said before, and I think it'll keep going in that direction. The audiences get smaller and smaller for a few reasons. Some of them are what I already articulated. Another right. one is a matter of trust. There is no more the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite, or anybody else like that. Generally, in, in the heyday of my career, in the heyday of the television networks, we would have each of us on a big night, particularly when people knew there was some big story and they didn't have a computer in front of them, and they would run home and sit on the edge of the couch and watch the news. Um, we'd have 30 to 35 million viewers apiece, each of us. So that came to about 100 million viewers. These days, the legacy networks, which are ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN, MSNBC, and Fox combined don't have 35 million viewers. Correct. So that's, that's the answer. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was actually a radio newsie when I was in college, and then I went to law school and abandoned it. You How abandoned you an honest career. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Women were a little challenged uh, in those <laughs> days. Um, but how did you get your start? How did you get into this? Yeah, I'm a product of dumb luck. <laughs> I went to the University of California at Berkeley in the mid-1960s. Um, and there was something going on that maybe older members of the audience will remember called the free speech movement. And it was a series of basically civil rights demonstrations during the civil rights movement days. And I was a fraternity guy, but you know, every day, some, uh, some days they'd shut down the campus, they'd collapse police cars, they'd take over the administration building of the student union, and I was a fascinated spectator. <laughs> you know, and I began to realize, I started noticing the grown-ups who were watching, and they were wearing ties, it was all men in those days, and had notepads, they were the reporters, and they were getting paid for, to be where I was for nothing. And I went up to one of them one day and said, do you always get to go where the action is? Little did I know how he was dooming me when he said, oh yeah, kid, and he just slapped me on the back. You know, when this story's over, I'll be someplace else excited. And he happened to be the reporter from the ABC, has nothing to do with me working for ABC, but the ABC of, uh, owned, owned station in San Francisco, right across the bay from Berkeley. And he said, you know, we have an intern. I talked to him for several days. He told me about an internship. I went down and applied, and I was just lucky, and I got accepted. Then I decided, since I had, I'd been on my way to law school, but I changed course that I should get a degree, but it was too late at Berkeley. I was already well on my way to political science. So I went to grad school at Northwestern. And ABC had a bureau there that covered the Midwest and the South. And they needed a, a low-level employee for five months while, while the two producers there took their vacations and the editors took their vacations. And I got it. I mean, just, I'd been in a newsroom. So, you know, as an intern at the station in San Francisco. So I got it. And just s several other lucky breaks 
Right place at the right time. In the wrong lane. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg Dobbs. Thanks.